Hi, good afternoon everyone and Salam Ramadan and happy fasting to those observing. I'm Joel Goh from Think City. I'd like to welcome everyone from Malaysia and around the world to the last in our series of Earth Day webinars that we have been hosting this week in celebration of Earth Day. The Think City Institute will continue to host webinars in the future, so do look at our social media for updates. Today we have uh, we will be talking about the circular economy in action, and our three distinguished speakers will be discussing on how we can all live more sustainable lives in the way we choose to consume. So we'll be having Jacqueline Chang from the Circular Economy Club, Melissa Tan from the Green Gorilla, and Luan Sia from CIMB. So, our first speaker is Jacqueline Chang. Uh, she's the country representative for Malaysia and CEC, uh, the Circular Economy Club. She was appointed by the CEC's headquarters in London in April 2019 to create the CAC in Malaysia. Uh, it started in KL and has expanded to PJ, uh, Petaling Jaya and Penang in less than a year. The CEC is present in 140 countries and over 260 cities. Jacqueline has 16 over years of experience uh, in global strategy and consulting and portfolio management backed up by finely tuned legal and blue ocean shift consulting acumen. She has international working experience in over 15 countries and has completed the University of Cambridge's business sustainability management at the CISL. Uh, prior to that, she was admitted as a barrister in the Temple UK and as an advocate and solicitor in Malaysia. She also has a master's in international business from IESEG School of Management, France. So uh, over to you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, I would like to share a video with everyone. Um, CEC has closely worked with our key stakeholder, World Economic Forum. Thank you. A planet that needs to provide 50% more energy, 50% more food, 30% more water over the next couple of decades, it simply is not going to happen unless we change the way that we consume. The circular economy is a fundamentally different economic model. It's taking the entire global economy, looking at it through a different lens and saying how can we valorise our economy to a higher level. So never at any point would anything made within a circular economy become waste. In all the systems, we are basically not properly addressing the need for change. In a circular economy thinking, we actually will recuperate the value of the product when it comes to the end of its life cycle look at the commodity indexes of the last hundred years, we saw that price come down for a century. The problem is those prices have more volatility in them than we've ever seen before in history. The supply of these polymers are one of the most abundant resources we have on a daily basis. If you use less energy, you use less chemical to produce new material, of course you're going to have financial savings. This is the largest business opportunity ever seen by our species. With recurring revenues, that come out of a base of customers that will take my product as a service, I can build a very profitable and recurring revenue stream. It has developed over time exactly into a virtual ownership of the material throughout the whole product life cycle. What the customer needs to see is personal benefit to them. They've got to walk into a shop, into a store online and see that they buy a product and service that they want. It's sexy, it's aspirational, it's the right price point. Oh, and by the way, it's also circular. With technology, materials, science, uh, the Internet of Things, we can use our innovation and creativity to really build an economy that is more circular. Thank you to Think City and their collaborators for this invitation today. The Circular Economy Club um, in Malaysia has launched the Circular Cities Week uh, in autumn 2019. It is an annual and global event where CEC local organizers like myself run workshops uh, to push for the design and implementation of circular economy strategies in over 80 cities worldwide. This effort coincides uh, with the UN uh, World Cities Day on 31st of October annually. This is uh, what I will cover um, at the webinar today um, in eight areas. Uh, just a quick summary, uh, we are the largest international network uh, with over 6,000 professionals and organizations in 140 countries. We, our vision is uh, you know, a new era where all cities worldwide function through a circular model setting the end to an age of waste. 
So collectively, our mission is to bring the circular economy to cities worldwide by building strong local networks to design, implement the circular local strategies together, embed it in the education system and help circular solution scale. So I'll start by um, uh, defining um, you know, a linear economy, which we know as take, make, use, waste, and the circular economy, which basically is to eliminate the concept of waste by enabling the recovery, the reuse of all materials at the highest value possible times. This is um, the uh, butterfly diagram developed by the Alan MacArthur Foundation in 2013. It is fundamental in understanding the circular economy. It is referred as the butterfly diagram because of the two sides. You will see the biomaterials green on the left and technical materials blue on the right flowing through the system. A common question that has been asked of me is how does sustainability differ from circularity? And I usually explain it in this way. So sustainable initiatives include all practices that allow us to grow in a way that the needs of the future are not compromised. So from a sustainability lens, we can continue growing sustainably by generating less harm to the environment. In a circular economy, the main goal is not doing less harm. The main goal is doing good to our ecosystems. Therefore, it allows us to achieve not only sustainability, but also to regenerate our ecosystems at the same time. So a circular economy is not about reducing waste. It is about designing a world where waste is not created in the first place. I'm going to dissect the butterfly diagram and now focus on the tech loops. Now, you can see that the loops are from smaller to the widest, representing maintenance, uh, reuse, refurbish, recycle. The smallest loops are the most efficient for a product to go back into the cycle versus the widest loop, uh, which is recycling, which entails the largest amount of energy, water and downgrading of materials for the product to go back into the cycle. Hence, it is crucial to prioritize uh, designing products uh, which could go back into the cycle using the smaller loops. So uh, one example you can look at are modular homes that are built and designed by IDEO. Usually circular economy practitioners will share with you that designing a product that is modular, easy to dissemble, then it, it, it's usually easier than designing a product which can be recycled. Now I'll move on to the bio loops, right? So my prof at uni used to explain to us in a very simple way. It is simply from nature, for people living in nature, that goes safely back to nature. So if I take um, anaerobic digestion, right, it thrives as a process in an oxygen-free environment in which the microorganisms decompose bio uh, materials such as food waste into biogas. So then biogas is then combusted for different purposes like generating uh, electricity, heat or transportation fuels. Uh, for the aerobic composting, that process thrives in the um, oxygen uh, environment, right? So the microorganisms like fungi will decompose the biomaterials such as uh, your fruit, your bread, uh, eggshells, meat into a moist humus that can be used to return nutrients back to the soil. So a little bit about Circular Cities Week, um, you know, so last year successfully about 80 cities actually signed up and that is how we have mapped it on the screen for you. Um, the purpose is to convince, support the city governments to publish, you know, local circular economy strategy plans with clear goals for cities, uh, create an open source report like, you know, identifying challenges, opportunities and next steps for all the participating cities. Uh, so far, um, you know, these are the cities that have been like uh, registering for this uh, Circular Cities Week. We have Seattle, Sydney, Kuala Lumpur, Tallinn Jaya, Penang, uh, Vienna, Kampala, and London. And they have been um, hosting it for a number of years, but Malaysia only did it for the first time last year. So this is one of my favorite parts um, of the presentation because the Circular Economy Club created the Circular City Canvas. This slide is an example of what um, participants would brainstorm um, in their groups 
and it is key to convey the strategy in only one page, not more. So um, when you look at the first column on top sectors, uh, we usually tell participants to uh, think of the top contributing sectors in your city in terms of GDP or what makes your city competitive. Then discuss uh, business sectors like textiles, agriculture, or rather um, what every city needs. Uh, for example, construction, uh, transport, water. And then you go on to the top impacts. When you think of that sector, you also have to identify the top environmental impacts that you want to achieve. What are the resources that are consumed and what are the outputs? And then when you have identified top sector inputs, outputs produced, uh, then you need to then articulate what are the circular solutions for each of them. And this can fall in terms of uh, circular design, uh, use of renewable resources, new business models, material reuse or recycling. And then you apply the nudge theory, which you would like to influence in terms of uh, behavior change and then also the next steps. So um, the Circular Cities Week, right, is usually our flagship uh, global knowledge transfer workshop because we want to use this platform to communicate this. Supply chain entities face a crisis and opportunity uh, simultaneously. As the world grows more concerned over environment, um, sustainability and cost, modern supply chains must evolve into a circular supply network. Not a straightforward line like network, but where reverse logistics should be as sophisticated as the forward logistics. So I choose everyday examples like shoes, lighting and water bottles. So Nike incorporated the recycled materials into footwear and apparel. 71% uh, of all Nike footwear and apparel incorporates recycled materials and you can do a little bit more research on Nike grind. Philips, as you saw the video earlier, has light as a service. So they shifted their um, ownership model to offer lighting as a service and they committed to carbon neutrality for its um, global operations by 2020. They want to reduce to zero. They want to drive down carbon emissions in operations, logistics, um, business travel to becoming uh, more energy efficient. They purchase the energy from renewable sources and compensate remaining emissions via carbon credits. Unilever, on the other hand, is trying to treat waste packaging as a new valuable resource and 25% recycled pets by 2020 in their water plastic bottles. Then the next question we come about is, um, you know, what is a circular city if we envision it for Malaysia? Um, it should um, embed the principles of a circular economy across uh, all functions, uh, establishing an urban uh, system that is regenerative, uh, accessible and abundant by design. This city should aim to eliminate the concept of waste keep assets at their highest value at all times and enabled by digital technology. So I myself foresee like Kuala Lumpur, you know, being able to generate prosperity, increase livability, improve resilience, and its citizens, uh, you know, will be, you know, able to enjoy all this by aiming to decouple the creation of value from the consumption of finite resources. Um, so uh, this, I'm going to give a snapshot on the results from Circular Cities Week last year. Um, you know, we started uh, way back in 2012 with 30 cities and now, you know, we have expanded to 80 cities. Um, we have identified uh, five top uh, challenges. You know, what are the unclear benefits, you know, lack of incentives, demand for more training. Um, you know, the amount of disposables and plastic packaging, intense water and energy consumption. We also um, identified top opportunities such as, you know, creation of policies, incentivization, leveraging on big data, blockchain, AI and robotics, um, you know, provide transparency across the supply chain, create markets, and of course, things like renting or leasing. Uh, this is just a snapshot. Um, top five sectors identified, and of course, on the other hand, we've also identified other sectors. 
So I want to go into um, you know some real life case studies um, being implemented by my colleagues. Uh, for each like each uh, real life case study, I want to highlight um, you know the key areas marked in green because uh, I have to keep to my time limit. I can't cover um, Europe and the US this time around, but I hope it's okay for everyone. Um, I chose those green highlighted areas because I think Malaysia can realistically implement it by our own Malaysians with the key stakeholders. So the first one I wanted to tackle was the waste pickers um, into the recycling economy. So Unilever um, in South Africa partnered with African Reclaimer Organization and the WITS University to announce the project called Building an Inclusive Circular Economy Recycling with Reclaimer. So it's about re integrating these um, reclaimers, also known as waste pickers, in Malaysia, we call them informal sector for the service. So they provide um, and design and demonstrate the benefits okay, of how re reclaimers play a role in society. And in um, Johannesburg, they have successfully uh, collected about you know, 80 to 90% of post-consumer paper and packaging and for recycling companies to reuse and have extended the life of landfills and saved municipalities up to South Africa rand of 750 million. And that um, translates to 175 million ringgits a year in landfill airspace. Um, and then what the other innovative thing that they, they really did quite well was the open source community engagement. So the um, Institute of Future Living and Stop Reset Go hosted workshops to discuss um, the use of uh, open source solutions and methodologies to create circular products that are easy to produce and repair. It is here I want to stress that, you know, it, it, you can't be selfish and you can't be territorial, therefore share for free. Um, we moved on to the next um, region closer to home, Asia, Oceania, and I want to zoom into Singapore and right into extended producer responsibility, where producers are responsible for the end of life of their products. Um, in electronics in particular, uh, an e-waste management system will be in place by 2021, where producers uh, need to recover uh, e-waste and ensure it gets either reused or recycled. Likewise, company using packaging will need to collect data on package put into the market and present their plans to reduce it. And then what they did next was, you know, in collaboration with the EU led mission, they wanted to address financing circularity. And then by combining local and external um, expertise, they decided to come with a list of recommendations how to finance circular projects, establish the right policies, provide the correct financial incentives to companies, perform risk assessments on supply chain and commercial risk. So, you know, it previously, Mestat used to advocate solar panels on rooftops. Well, CEC practitioners advocate urban farming on top of the shopping malls. So there is this place called Comcrop. It's about 600 square meters, which is equivalent to 6,450 square meters. Farm on a shopping mall that uses vertical racks and hydroponics to grow leafy greens such as basil, peppermint. And these leaves are then sold to nearby um, bars and restaurants and stores. Now, the benefit of such an initiative is uh, reducing the urban heat island effect where the city is warmer than rural areas. It also avoids the runoff of storm water. And I think Singapore has, you know, been quite good in this and savings are around 160 billion Sing dollars annually real right. Um, the next one I want to talk about is bring your own school program. Now, Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Sri Hatamas has started this in their canteens. Um, I'm very proud of them. But let's look at Singapore and how we can involve the Ministry of Education in Malaysia to implement it in all states, in all types of schools with the Students Reward Program. So the Southeast Asia Aquarium supports conservation efforts, um, educational, public engagement activities to help protect ocean health uh, by decreasing marine litter. So with the Bring Your Own Schools program, youngsters are encouraged you know, to attend assembly talks, um, exhibitions to reduce plastic, 
uh, how to protect uh, the marine environment and also encourage to bring their own reusables like bottles, containers, uh, utensils and how they are rewarded is through an innovative reward card system. Um, Hi, Jeff. Uh, just a uh, reminder, you have two minutes left. Oh, wow. Sorry. Okay. Um, if that's the case, then I will have to skip uh, Medellin. And then now I want to go into a local case study. Um, this was in 2018. Um, this was a project led by Aslan Yaakob. Um, we identified, um, as the program advisor at that time, I identified a problem after the engagement with YB Hena Yo at TDDI Residence Association. As you can see, um, the offering level um, in terms of cost incurred by government was very high. So we then decided to create a value proposition delivering sustainable business-minded solutions for key community needs, uh, whereby we can create high impact and low cost, you know, sustainable, scalable models across the country, create jobs for the youth and address community and national needs. Then um, I created a, you know, a 2B strategy canvas uh, for the team to consider, whereby you know, the youth are creating circular economy across the country. It is here that it's important, you know, you need to eliminate and reduce what is negative uh, in the current situation and raise and create the offerings that you can achieve uh, for a circular economy. So, um, you know, I had a mix in my uh, toolkit and, you know, I basically explain it to the investors as it's a systematic process to move away from disposable of uh, organic waste to landfills, you know, by opening up the blue oceans for communities, inspire the grassroots uh, people to jump on board. Um, we want to thank uh, CIMB Foundation uh, for, you know, supporting us for the pilot program and also for round two. Um, I want also to thank uh, people like Melissa, you know, um, for being uh, active on social media with the other um, cafes, especially the coffee cafes. Um, so, you know, uh, then the next question I want to address is, you know, how do the municipalities can become more circular? And then, you know, when you look at role of new technologies, as I don't have time, um, the one case study I want to recommend is the Amsterdam, Amsterdam Circle Scan. And then uh, to create new markets, you should look at Circular Peterborough in the UK. And then um, I we spoke about top challenges and top opportunities before, but most importantly, in your design for a CE city, make sure that you have a robust infrastructure for reverse logistics. Um, these are all the materials about circular cities. I'm happy to share with you. If you can, you know, just drop me an email. Um, this, uh, because I spoke about the um, example earlier the local example and um, you know it's centered on urban permaculture farms and um, I'm, I'm recommending this book to everyone i know you know 601 pages is a lot but a good starting point would be chapter 14 where you can uh, look through strategies in considering alternatives and you'll be amazed at how bill mollison has articulated um, his ideas and uh, you know i just want to stress that you know unlike organic farming uh, urban permaculture can thrive in undulating lands, so you don't have to flatten the ground before planting um, anything. Um, the other thing I think that's important is after you um, implement every circular economy initiative, you should uh, engage with your local government, you know, uh, support each other, publish a local circular economy strategy with clear goals, and stay tuned for Circular Cities Week 2020. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say thank you to my co-leads, uh, Josephine Tan, the General Manager of Penang Green Council, who co-leads Penang with me, and Misuri uh, Yo from Ecosoft Foods, who co-leads PJ with me and who is uh, a waste management expert. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. That was a very formative uh, presentation, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions from the audience, uh, and they can get in touch with you later on. Uh, but moving to the next speaker. Um, uh, Melissa Tan is a zero waste practitioner, environmental speaker and TV host who uses a platform to advocate for sustainable living and zero waste habits for everyone. She co-founded an eco-collective called The Green Gorilla and joins forces with other environmental organizations and businesses to make green mainstream through conscious events, content creation and campaigns. 
So over to you, Melissa. Thanks so much. Uh, okay, let's jump straight into it, guys. Um, I'm going to be talking about circular economy in action from this perspective of an individual. So very often, when it comes to individuals, we often um, get a lot of this in our news cycle where we are talk, the conversation circulates around um, awareness around the destruction that is happening with our rainforests, with our oceans, with our rivers, and all the mining that, 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 that happens in this linear economy of take, make, use, and waste. We have a disposable culture over consumption where we produce more and we produce cheaper. And it doesn't add to our welfare as well. So a lot of, <clears throat> so again, a lot of the conversation is around awareness. And for individuals, that can lead to a lot of helplessness as well. We've seen really great movements like the climate strikes where people rally behind the environmental movement and call for better. But again, that takes time because structural change takes time. So on an individual level, we're often, we often feel helpless and we stick to blaming industries. We blame, in, we blame the government. We blame the entire capitalist economy for the state of, of our environment. But the thing that we forget sometimes is that individuals are part of the problem. When we move, we, we, we agree that we need to move towards a circular economy, but it needs everyone to, to move towards the same direction. So that includes government, communities, businesses, industries, and individuals. The good thing about individuals is we don't have to wait for the reality of circular economy to arrive on our shores because that will take time. And there are brilliant minds across the world that is working very hard to bring that um, to us. But before that becomes a universal truth, um, we can do something through our lifestyles itself. Because we as, we as individuals are the demand. Without demand, there is very little incentive for businesses and industries to produce this way and create that waste because if there's no one to buy it, there's no financial incentive to produce it. So Malaysians on average produce about 1.2 to 2 kilograms of waste every single day. And when you average that and, and, and times that over a year, each of us is producing 700 kilograms of waste that we're sending to the landfill um, every year, more than half a ton. And the thing about that is, the waste in that landfill is, a lot of it is not only avoidable, it is also recoverable. So the avoidable waste is stuff like single-use plastic that we use for mere minutes but exist for the next 200 years in a landfill or, or in the sea. It is also a result of the overproduction and overconsumption of a lot of products that we also use for a very short period of time and then chuck really quickly. When I talk about waste that is recoverable, right off the bat, 50% um, of it is food waste. So almost 50% of the waste in landfills is food waste and organic matter that should be returned into our soil to feed it again in what was a, a circular system, but is now locked away in a landfill. That's because waste is not segregated. There's no state-run composting. So we need to fill more and more landfills and we have to clear even more forested land to fill it with trash. So when we talk about recoverable, recoverable waste, there is also a problem with recycling. I know a lot of you are familiar with this. The recycling system is imperfect. Only 9% of plastics in the world has ever been recycled. Plastic is downcycled, so there is a finite number of times that you can recycle it. And a lot of products that we use every day is designed without end-of-life solutions in mind. So the waste that is recyclable, they are not making it to recycling as well because there's limited availability of recycling, there's gaps in the infrastructure, consumer behavior is an issue. I'm sure each and every one of us has 10 friends that we can think of that don't recycle at all, um, and low government enforcement. So we see things like that happen, where it not only um, fills up our landfills, it bleeds into our oceans, affecting wildlife and ourselves because we are part of the food chain as well. So we don't have to buy into the system. And there are a lot of limitations around recycling. So should we recycle? Yes. Do we need better recycling? Yes. But we can't recycle our way out of this situation right now because of 
the current state of how we are consuming and producing. So here's a thought for us to consider. What if we were to recycle less, not more? If we had less recyclable waste, then we would not have to deal with the problem of recycling um, until you know innovation catches up and until it is practiced universally in our country. Um, we also get to minus off the carbon footprint of recycling itself. And what if we stop sending waste to landfills or the incinerator because we didn't create the waste? So this is zero waste living. This is what we as individuals can do. And this is climate action as an individual. And the aim of zero waste living is very similar to um, what circular economy is trying to achieve, which is to send nothing to the landfill. It is also low impact living where we think about all the ways that we can reduce our carbon impact to its minimal amount so that the carrying capacity of Earth can sustain more of the population. So there are five R's of zero waste living. Um, this was created by Bea Johnson of Zero Waste Home. Refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. A lot of us grew up with three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. And now we have more R's to, to rethink how we can reprogram the way we consume um, to be more sustainable and to move towards uh, mimicking a circular economy from the perspective of an individual. Um, we also have things like rethink and repair, so that technically the seven R's, but I won't get into that at this point. So before I go on, I'm going to also disclaim uh, that zero waste living is not about achieving zero because we as individuals cannot achieve absolute zero because our industry and marketplace at this current point in time cannot support that. We cannot control the waste that happens upstream and downstream. But instead of feeling helpless and powerless in this situation, we're taking agency back and taking um, controlling our sphere of what we can control to reduce that impact as minimally as possible. So I'm just going to show you what a zero waste lifestyle can look like. This is Lauren Singer's jar. So imagine 700 kilograms of trash that you produce every year now in five years you can produce just a single jar of trash so really achieving that aim of sending nothing to landfill almost so i'm going to go quickly through the arts there are so much opportunities for us to refuse the waste that we are creating right now in our the way we consume so that's not only just packaging waste uh, the things that we need that we need to 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 live well and everything um is nutritious food and and clothes to wear um we don't need all the packaging that is surrounding it um that really uh really we're using for mere minutes and then it is it gets thrown away so you also notice that the first r is refuse that means that the first thing we can always do is say no. We don't have to buy into this whole system of overconsumption and overproduction. Um, we have the choice of saying no to bad business practices. So this also includes not only packaging waste and takeaway waste, which we often see with zero waste living. It is also all the little knickknacks and, and things that we buy sometimes at the spur of the moment because we use money to solve our problems. For example, I needed something to use today, I went to the five ringgit shop. I bought a cheap little knickknack that I will use and it's very low quality. It is used for a short period of time before it breaks and then I just throw it away. Again, all the freebies, the free t-shirts, the free umbrellas, all usually are made out of inferior quality um, and doesn't last for long. It is all future trash and it happens very quickly. So, Part of the lifestyle is building new habits. So think about all the ways, all, every time you, you get something in your hands, how would you avoid that waste? So this is bringing your own bags, your bottles, your containers, switching for women uh, to a reu uh, zero waste period with reusables. And it is not a lifestyle that is for the privilege, which often people think um, and have this misconception. Zero waste living isn't for people who have a lot of time and money. Is there always living is for everyone. 
So this is things like me shopping at the wet market, shopping at the rice guy, shopping at the egg guy, instead of going to the supermarket where everything is already prepackaged. So for everything you need for you to live well, there is always an unpackaged version and it is just diverting our demand from the packaged to the unpackaged. So that includes even things like uh, food and not only food, but like cleaning solutions, so everything. So let's move on to reduce. Uh, the quickest way we can cut our carbon impact is to cut down on our meat intake. And it doesn't mean that everyone has to turn vegan, although that would be great. But even from being a heavy meat eater to be a very occasional meat eater, um, that would help significantly because if everyone in the world cut their meat intake by half, it would be akin to half the population going vegan. So recycle is still part of, 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 of the uh, part of the consumption process for sure. But what we want to do is kind of um, use it as a last resort. So we have to recycle, right? So that's clean, sort them well and send them to the right drop off spots. But when you consume, also consume with end of life in mind. So every time you get a product um, in your hand, think about is this actually recyclable? What parts of it is recyclable? And if it is not, think about, do you really need it? Do you, is there an alternative for this that you can use instead so that you're not creating future trash? And the last R is rot. So um, Jacqueline has covered this in, to some extent. So again, half of our trash is food waste. And when you return that to the ground through composting, you're cutting half your trash immediately and re-energizing the soil that we have stripped and abused. Um, so this is a really great way to, to, to cut some of that out. And again, the, the other R's are rethink and repair. So repair extends the life of everything that you have and own um, instead of going through the usual process of, oh, this is broken, I'm going to throw this away and buy a new one. That wasn't how our grandmothers and our mother's generation used to consume, but that is a reality right now in our consumption society. So I'm going to jump back and think about rethink. So we have to rethink about our consumerism because zero waste living isn't just about plastic, it's not about packaging, it's about everything that we buy because everything that we buy is does have a carbon footprint, does have an environmental impact. And we have to rethink how we have been programmed to consume at such an unsustainable rate. Imagine last time we used to be like, okay, this is the beginning of a school year, I get one outfit, new outfit, and this is my first, um, this is my first outfit of the year or for Chinese New Year, and that's your outfit for the entire year. Now we're shopping every single week. So, you know, it, we have ramped it up at, at such a crazy rate. So I just want to address some of the, the ways we can think about this as well. It isn't about buying more, it's buying what you need and use what you have. So what we're doing is actually we're reprogramming ourselves to consume better, not to stop buying anything, don't support the economy, but we want to shift demand to to, to better businesses, to better business practices as well, and to readjust the way that we buy and consume things so that it is, um, so that we, again, not send anything to the landfill and reduce our carbon impact. So zero waste living, oftentimes, the people will come by and say, oh, so now I need to spend a lot of money to, to buy all this container, buy all these glass jars. And no, actually, zero waste living teaches us to also think about how we can learn the art of making do, to rethink every purchase that we make, whether we need it or not. So we consume in a way that adds value to us as well as minimize our impact to the environment. And I find that minimalism, the principles of minimalism, yeah. sorry, one minute left. Okay, principles of minimalism helps us a lot in that. Um, I'm an eco-minimalist myself, so the I mean, I'm an eco minimalist myself, so it really helps me to not be triggered by all the marketing signals that is sent our way every single day with all the sales that's happening, especially now when everyone's just, you know, trying really hard to survive. And 
at the same time, a lot of people are stuck at home during MCO and looking at their house and going through this mass decluttering that is that that they have with their free time now because they're confronted with all the clutter in their in their house. And then thinking, how did I why did I even why do I even have this? Why was this even useful? Why did I buy this? Because now it's all becoming trash that I need to get rid of my house. So so that that has been um, very helpful to me. So when we consume, we consume better, we choose quality over quantity, we choose more sustainable options because we as the individual, all, all our millions of people, when we buy with someone, we're actually voting with our ringgit. So when you buy something that is from a brand that doesn't really care about what how they produce and all the end of life solutions, we're telling them, hey, keep making it this way. I will support you, I will buy from you so just go go with it it's fine but when you shift to businesses that 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 produce better and to, that always think about the triple bottom line you are encouraging the industry to move towards that direction as well and um there i have a few more slides here about um um the the question of ownership so um jacqueline has also covered this as well earlier how we don't actually need to own things um what you can do is be part of the sharing economy. So every time, I, every time I need something, I don't actually have to own it. I might use a vacuum every day, but I'm not gonna use an electric drill every day. Um, so every time I need something, I always try and source it secondhand first, because then we're extending the life of a product and keeping it in use instead of buying new things, producing them, and then sending them to the landfill. It's optimizing the way that we consume. So, so start now, start today. Don't, um, don't underestimate the power of one person because people are always watching your actions. People are influenced in a way that you, do not, you may not be able to see and there's always a domino effect that happens. Um, you can be the change that happens in your community, in your family, in your company, in, in your friend circle, in your social circles and it all accumulates over your entire lifetime. So imagine that 700 kilograms of trash that you produce every day going down to almost zero. Think about what that means. So it doesn't end with you. And engage with your community. So there are really a bunch of really great people have, that have been collaborating with Think City this, this week. Um, so what you want to do is be a part of that community. Things like Zero Waste Malaysia have a lot of resources that can help you to apply all those R's in your life with all the resources that we have um, existing in Malaysia because um, a lot of it is grassroots movement. So the fun thing about this is uh, action that is, is happening at all levels of, 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 us, of society and it's about us sharing with people and, and throwing our weight behind those um, organizations as well. So thank you so much everyone. Uh, Again, avoid waste by consuming better. Thank you so much, Melissa. Those were some really useful, actionable, uh, practical tips for us. Um, moving on to our next speaker, Luan Xie. Uh, she's the head of group sustainability at CIMB, one of ASEAN's leading biking groups, where she is responsible for transforming CIMB into a leader in sustainable finance and responsible banking in Asia. Uh, Luan has extensive experience in strategy and transformation, as well as change management uh, in a number of fields, including financial services and consulting. Uh, she was also a founding member of a startup company. Luan holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's degree in Manufacturing Engineering, as well as a Master of Arts from the University of Cambridge and is currently taking courses in hopes of att attaining a Master's of Liberal Arts Sustainability at Harvard Extension School. So over to you, Luan. Thank you very much, Joe. So for those of you who don't know, um, since 2019, uh, sustainability has really been a core strategy of CIMB. Um, and we've really reorientated the entire organization to think about how we can be a more responsible bank. So um, if you think about it, um, sustainability in CIMB now is as important as customer service, as important as our people in tech and data. So that, that's just an uh, uh, to give you a feel of how high it is on our agenda. So um, I'll not bore you with this, but there are three key things that we're doing in terms of sustainability. One is 
what is our direct footprint and impact? So um, what is our greenhouse gas emission? How do we uh, reduce our consumption of water, of materials? Um, but also, um, like who, who are the, the, the suppliers that we buy from? And are they sustainable? The second pillar is in terms of our clients. So how do we help our business clients, but as well as individual clients, how do we help and encourage them to be more sustainable and facilitate that? as well. And society, we've been doing for a while through CIB Foundation, and that is um, uh, kind of the philanthropic uh, side of sustainability at CIMB. So, um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, today, I wanted to give you an example of the circular economy in action. And my example, my story starts with this. Um, for those who don't know what this is, um, this is a power washer. So it creates um, kind of high pressure jets and um, sprays everything off and everything becomes super clean. So we thought, so we bought it um, at a kind of like a, some sort of fair convention thing. We used it a total of one time and it ended up here. Okay. so. And I'm sure uh, many of you have storerooms that look like this uh, in the hope, I guess, that uh, we would eventually use it um, someday. But normally what then happens is things start deteriorating, things get dusty, and we uh, realize that we need to start decluttering, and then we eventually throw it away. This is not my storeroom, by the way, but uh, mine is only slightly better than this. So what's the solution? So this is this is a concept that I wanted to introduce you to. It's uh, the library of things. So what is it? Um, it's really a place, um, instead of having books, um, this library contains things. So, um, and what are these things? So these are things, for example, like the power washer that you might only use once a year or things that you're not even sure whether you want and whether um, are effective, but you wanted to try before you buy, um, or things that you might use um, quite rarely, or, or you know, um, for the, for people who have excess things, like in my storeroom that I want to give away, they're too good. I mean, they're still in working condition, and I don't know what to do with it. So you can donate it to the library of things. So in this way, um, instead of buying, we can borrow. So this is a great example of the sharing economy. And we keep things in circulation for longer and we end up, uh, well, it still, I guess, ends up in the, in, in the disposal at, at some point, but it's used many more times uh, by many more people uh, than if you just kept it for yourself. So um, what happened was um, this lady, um, Aslin from our commercial banking team, she's actually listening in the audience now, um, suggested this idea and she said, hey, you know, what if we do this um, in our office building uh, for our staff? Um, and this was part of a project uh, called Advancing CIMB Towards Sustainability, uh, CIMB Acts. And this is a program where um, our employees can um, come up with ideas and implement them uh, for, for the good of the bank as well as for the environment and society. So how does this work? So um, first thing is um, things are donated to the library, the items are then categorized, and there and we have a website where everything is loaded. Um, as a member of the of the uh, library of things, you can browse for availability and, and item descriptions. You reserve the item online, so you say when you want it, when you want to pick it up, when you're going to return it, and um, then when you pick up the item, you pay for you pay a deposit, you use it, and then you return it, and then it goes um, back into the library for the next person to use. So just quickly, what this looks like. Um, so this is our main, uh, the main page. Um, so we've got all the different categories here. We've got about 250 items right now. Uh, we only started collecting things, I think, at the very end of last year, and uh, we've just opened the library for use. Um, unfortunately, though, this is currently only for CIMB staff because we know where they live and work and we can go and track down the item if it goes missing. Um, so these are here with the categories. Uh, 
Now, if you go into some of the categories, these are some examples of the items that we have. So things like sleeping bags that you might use every, only when you go camping, a sports cam, uh, a, a camping light, um, crutches, right, uh, wheelchairs. So this is something that, you know, God forbid, you, you probably only want to use once in your lifetime. But these are quite expensive items as well. So you probably don't want to buy these items, but borrow them instead. Um, Winter clothing for people who want to go uh, traveling, especially for kids stuff, um, they outgrow their 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 clothes um, so quickly. So and these things are pretty expensive as well. Um, of course, for these items, uh, we do have some conditions where uh, people need to uh, dry clean them and bring them back um, in good condition before we give them uh, back their deposit. And somebody mentioned power tools. Yep exactly this so we've got lots of power tools you wouldn't imagine the, the number of power tools uh, uh lawn mowers power drills glue guns that we have coffee machines so so let's say you've picked um an item that you that you want to borrow you can see actually you can see who, who donated it uh which is just a, a a nice touch um you can see how much the deposit is and then if you look at the bottom you can see when it's available and then you put in when you want to uh, borrow it and when you're going to return it and then you add it to your basket um, uh, because we are doing it for free um, the charge is zero apart from the deposit uh, but for other libraries that we've seen uh, this is the only one that i've seen in malaysia but um, for other ones they do charge a fee so here are some examples or testimonials for, for when people have uh, use the library. Um, on the left is actually our very first customer. So what happened was that uh, our staff, so uh, Peter Billish on the left is our staff, his uh, good friends came visiting from uh, Europe and they accidentally left their stroller in the back of a taxi. So um, instead of buying one, they borrowed a stroller from our library. And on the right is um, somebody trying out an air fryer. Uh, this air fryer was actually from me. I used it at Grand Total of about two times. So yeah, and, and now it's uh, put into good use. So um, that's actually it for me. So it was just, it's a very simple concept. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, it's only for uh, people in CIMB. However, um, if you're interested in starting this up on your own for your community or in your company, um, we are more than happy to um, give you some guidance, uh, talk to you about how to do it. Uh, by the way, this, this platform that we're using is called Lend Engine. Um, it only costs five pounds a year. So it's really, really uh, uh, almost costless. Um, so it's, it's very, very doable. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luan. That was a brilliant example of the circular economy in action. Um, if I may just invite uh, all the speakers back for the Q&A session. Um, and we have quite a few questions. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I'll just try to go through a few quickly. Um, there's a comment from Michelle that the circular economy is effective and it does not create waste. Uh, consumerism is uh, the biggest problem, actually, and that's what needs to be solved. And Peter Chi also mentioned that uh, there needs to be a change of lifestyles. So um, a question, I guess, for everyone in general. So in the current situation with the lockdown and the COVID and post-COVID situation, how would you see this impacting uh, the circular economy in your own areas of work or in your own personal experiences? And also with the recession looming around the corner, would some of these initiatives reach a roadblock? Um, maybe uh, anyone wants to go ahead? Uh, maybe Luan, you're in start. Well, for me, um, I have uh, been spending a lot less, obviously, uh, but I have a confession. I cannot cook for nuts, even with the air fryer. So I've been doing a lot of dry food. I've been trying to uh, reuse re all the containers, uh, but not great, unfortunately. Um, can I go second, Joe? Yeah, go ahead. And if those are not speaking, could you just uh, mute your microphones? Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, so for the COVID-19, right, I think one of the key issues you need to think about is um, equipping yourselves with climate resilient tools, climate change resilient tools, and food scarcity and food security is going to be a very key issue. Um, start grassroots movements and community projects where you grow your own urban permaculture farm, your own edible garden, you know, composting your food waste, planting, selling it on a Sunday market, make the money, 
generate the profits and then it goes back into the cycle of the farm to actually start uh, multiplying. So um, that is one idea I can think of, uh, starting at grassroots. Don't wait for the government and the private sector. Thank you. So I'll just share from the perspective of an individual. I think COVID has also, um, it's, it's horrible, but it's also given a lot of people chance to think about how they prioritize their spending. So a lot of fashion businesses are throwing sales left and right, but even with 50% off, no one is biting because they, they've suddenly realized that when you prioritize your resources, into things that are that really really add value to your life for example food and electricity and internet instead of buying more clothes or or, or just going on a shopping binge um, that has really helped people to kind of think about the way that they consume as well and when we want to talk about uh, disposables and things like that uh, a lot of things like hygiene has come into to question especially with, uh, with with the zero waste community like everyone is um, also kind of doubting what, what does it what does this mean we need so much surgical masks we need so much um, um, surgical gloves and things like that um, so that does that mean zero waste just doesn't work because we need to be safe and that's true health is most important but that's why we have to shift and prioritize again what is really important is it keeping yourself safe or buying all these things because the earth carrying capacity is like that and how do you want to split the pie? Do you want to do you want to focus it on where the, where we need it, the medical industry, or do you want to say no? You know what? This doesn't work. So let's just like consume as usual all those other places and add on the waste of the medical industry. No, we're shifting all that carbon impact to the medical industry where we need it and diminishing all those parts over here, the the unnecessary parts or where we can afford to lose. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Another question from Zinaida Fadiva um, to all presenters. Um, what is the strategy with finding data on the circular economy in Malaysia? Uh, what sources do you normally use? Um, maybe Jack, do you want to uh, uh, go ahead uh, and answer? Okay, so Juan Zinaida, um, I would encourage you to go to circulareconomyclub.com. We have an open source network. Um, we have implemented 3,000 circular economy initiatives worldwide. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's free. Um, you can download all the previous reports. The data is actually global. So um, data is collected after you implement, well, before you implement your project or your initiative and therefore after. Um, you have all the key contacts um, in that Excel spreadsheet, so you shouldn't hesitate to contact them. Um, it is by region as well as by country and also by city. Yeah, uh, Melissa and Luen, uh, anything to add to that? Okay, so we've almost run out of time, but maybe I would like to give the speakers 30 seconds each to just any final words or if there's any <laughs> questions that you'd like to address. Uh, maybe let's start with uh, Luen, 30 seconds. Wow, uh, what can I say that's not already been said? Um, I would say, you know, everybody, um, you can do your part if the the worst thing about you know uh saving the world is that you 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 always assume that somebody else is going to do it so if you're going to be you know um asking questions and things like that think about how you yourself can contribute um even now sorry here is my cmb plug even with the 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 banks and the banking products that you buy um you can choose a company or a, a loan or facility or, or a green deposit savings account, for example, uh, that can actually help you uh, help you save money as well as uh, save the planet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Melissa, go ahead. Okay. Um, really great. Um, apart from supporting all these great guys over here and all the good environment, amazing environmental organizations, throw your weight behind them, vote with your dollar, vote with your voice, be very vocal about it because we have social media and we have our loud, loud voices, not for singing karaoke, but for, yeah, we can still sing karaoke, but also to share about all these great resources because your community needs them. And sometimes it is just lack of awareness as well. Good ideas will spread like wildfire. So use your voice for that very reason. Um, apart from that, um, 
come find me on on instagram i share all those resources with you as well join um embed yourself in the community like zero waste malaysia um where all these resources are also widely shared because sometimes they're like right in front of you but you don't know and it is just because we're not searching for the right information so just open the door and start exploring okay thank you and jack uh 30 seconds final last words for today's session Okay, um, maybe I just want to share with you CEC's 5 to 10 year strategic plan in Malaysia. Um, we would very much like to appoint co-leaders or leaders in each state in Malaysia that exist, you know, like a galaxy of network nodes to transfer, you know, knowledge transfer CE and operate as an open source network. Everything we give and do should be free and from the heart. And, you know, take this opportunity to engage with government, private sector, non-governmental organizations, not-for-profits, uh, civil society organizations, associations to push for one united voice to ensure Malaysians can thrive in an ecosystem where waste is not generated in the first place at the design stage of any supply chain. Uh, this leader must have a huge fellowship, highly respected for his or her commitment and dedication and has a great influence in all the categories of stakeholders I mentioned just now and has a truly amazing and powerful network. And you know, you can email me. I'm happy to connect you to the people in um, London. And you know, you could share your ideas, you can share your strategy plans, and hopefully you can be a leader in your respective state. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, thank you to all our speakers today and to all those of you who have joined in our webinar. Um, thank you, Luen, Melissa and Jack for taking this time on this uh, on a Sunday afternoon. So our survey has been will be posted up. Uh, please do take a minute to fill that in. Um, and a note, the presentation slides will not be shared, but you'll be getting a link to rewatch the webinar at your own leisure. Um, finally, uh, just a final reminder to join us for tonight's uh, documentary watch party at 8.30 p.m. So the film is Climate Heroes, Carbon Neutral Living, and vanishing the extinction crisis is worse than you think. So I hope you have enjoyed uh, Think City's uh, session today. And until our next event, stay safe and stay inside. Thank you very much. <laughs>